Uh, my topic is modern day idolatry. I'm going to step off to the side so I can see the screen with the rest of you, and hopefully it'll work. Play button. That's the middle one. Top button. Okay. The bottom one. The other top. Yes. My wife's been doing that to me all week. She says, turn to the left. She says, and I come up to the corner, she says, that way. And I said, that's right. She said, well, that's the other left. You know, so... Thank you, Lee. Uh, I know how well you know that. Apparently you don't use this. Yes, you do. Um, starting off very fine, aren't we? This is a person who's selling idols in a store. When most people think of idols, this is what they think of. This is kind of the concept that uh, probably many people have of idolatry. And that is that it's something that superstitious people uh, in various countries today engaged in and superstitious people in the Old Testament engaged in. You see idols that are constructed out of wood, out of stone, uh, out of uh, metal, and they look like this, and they look something like this in various parts of the world. Uh, today, uh, you'll see also some that um, where you have the Buddha, and uh, this is a very prominent uh, idol in, in Hinduism and, and uh, uh, some of the Eastern religions. Uh, another picture of the same. And you've got the god Baal of the Old Testament, the god Molech of the Old Testament, which was actually a god that uh, some of the Israelites served in, uh, under the kings, the wicked kings that they served under, where children were actually passed through the fire. And what that means is that the children were placed under the outstretched arms of this uh, god, Molech, and burned to death. They were put into that plate alive and were burned to death as sacrifices by their parents. Uh, this is kind of a despicable kind of thing to think about, but this is what people think of when they think of idolatry. Uh, unfortunately, they don't think of idolatry in uh, our lives today. This young man says, idolatry uh, in my life? Well, it's not turning. There we go. And I want you to think about that in your own life today. I want you to be very personally involved in this and think about this from your own standpoint as to whether or not idolatry is something that we are guilty of yet today or whether we could be guilty of this today. Most persons do not make a connection between uh, modern-day idolatry or idolatry, which begins in the mind, and uh, their own service to the Lord or lack thereof. So what we're going to try to do today is kind of make this uh, become a reality for us. The problem of idolatry. Well, if we look at several passages. Uh, for example, this passage in, the Old T in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, you'll find Paul saying, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And then therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And he says then, well, it takes a while to change it, I guess. who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Uh, read that instead of creature, read that created things. Because the creature or the created things of this world are what you and I as human beings create or make. Uh, and we're worshipping or serving these things rather than the Creator uh, instead. So uh, that's what Paul's talking about. And he says, exchange the truth of God for the lie. I call that a deadly exchange. I do call it that. All right? A deadly exchange. The truth for a lie. And if you want to watch it here, it should change. All right? The lie instead of the truth. In uh, this kind of picture here, you've got another form of idolatry. These are excavations in various archaeological digs. Uh, in the Old Testament... Book of Isaiah, the 44th chapter. Now, there are several passages in the Scriptures that speak about idolatry, but this one's very clear. He speaks here in saying, The craftsman makes it like the figure of a man. He cuts down cedars for himself, then it shall be for a man to burn, for he'll take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes a carved image and falls down to it. Uh, he plants a pine and the rain nourishes it. He burns half of it in the fire even warms himself and says, Ah, I'm warm. I have seen the fire. And then the rest of it he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it, prays to it, and says, Deliver me, for thou art my god. 
you could imagine for a moment taking one of these wooden pews, cutting it in half, and uh, when on a cold winter day in your fireplace, you take some of it and you cut it up into smaller pieces and use it for firewood. The other half of it now, you carve some sort of an image in it, or you make some sort of an image in it and set it up on a standard somewhere, and you fall down and bow before it and worship it and say, Deliver me, my God. And how foolish would that be? Some of the second century Christians uh, chastised and even ridiculed their brethren for and people that were in their communities for falling down and worshiping gods that they created and made in this fashion. They said half of it you take home and you burn it. You cook your food over it on your cook stove. The other half of it you go over here and you carve an image, set it up in a standard, and you say, whew, I'm serving my God now. And how foolish is that? But that's the kind of thing people do when they are, are idol worshipers. But let's go a little further and see if we can make some connections to ourselves. Uh, scripture says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You're familiar with this. This is the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. The second, there is to be no other gods, which implies that we could serve other gods that are not real. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, these gods are not real gods. There's only one true and living God, but we can fall down and worship other gods. Otherwise, there'd be no reason for this commandment. By the way, the first commandment parallels exactly the passage used as the theme or the foundation for this lectureship. Have no other gods before me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus simply said it in a different way, but He said exactly the same thing. Notice the no graven image is part of this. Before and as... Moses was coming down from the mount with these tablets in his hand. His brother Aaron, pictured there, uh, had made a molten calf, or a calf out of the gold that the Israelites had, and they were frolicking around. Scripture doesn't even uh, define it in the English language as well as it should be because they were actually in a, a drunken, uh, immoral brawl of sorts, a big party, uh, worshiping this golden calf. Before Moses even got down from the mount with the Ten Commandments of God, they're already idolaters. You'll notice this as one of the temples in Greece. Of course, the Greeks were, uh, were famous for their idol worship. The Romans simply borrowed the Greek gods and renamed them and added a few of their own. But Paul was in this city. This is Athens. And Paul in the city of Athens spoke to the people there and said, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he's Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Then he went on to say, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. I want to focus on a couple of expressions here. Shaped by art and man's devisings. Where does idolatry occur? Well, you can carve something in stone. You can carve something in wood. You can mold something in metal or carve something in metal, but idolatry really begins in the imagination of man, doesn't it? It begins in the heart. You might give an expression in a, a kind of a physical form of some sort, but you don't have to give it expression. If it's man's devising or shaped by art, uh, you, may, you may make it into a physical form, but you cannot necessarily make it into a physical form. It, it could be just simply in the mind. And you could form that idol in your own mind and, and your own heart worship something other than God. Really, there's only one idol, as some have said, and you capitalize the word I and make it really large. There's only one idol. It's something that you place in your life above and before God, and that's what constitutes your God or the thing that you serve. Paul Tillich was an ultra-liberal theologian and philosopher from the University of Chicago wrote a book uh, that I, for a long time, didn't like much because he defined God in a different way than uh, I understood the Bible to define the Lord and I understood philosophical thinking to describe the God of heaven and earth. He called God ultimate concern. And he said, that which is God to you is that which is ultimately concerning to you. And really, he has a point. Whatever is your ultimate concern, whatever is most important in your life, whatever you spend your time thinking about, your money toward, your energy is extended toward this thing, whatever you have in your mind most of the time, what you focus upon in your life, that has become your God. Now, if it's God, the God of heaven and earth, and Christ His Son, well and good. If it's not, 
then we might be modern day idolaters. We might very well be modern day idolaters. Let's go a little further. This, of course, is another picture of a wall, and you'll see the idols that are carved into the sides. These have been carved out. Again, you don't have to carve them out. You could make them simply in your imagination. I'd like you to turn your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Fascinating passage. I want to show you something that I think you'll find to be somewhat interesting there. In 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul wrote this after he'd been in the city of Thessalonica just two Sabbath days. Uh, that is, in uh, Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 1, you'll read of his trip to Thessalonica. He was there for two Sabbath days, reasoning with them in the synagogues and converting people and forming the Thessalonian congregation. Now, that could be a total of three weeks if the Sabbath is somewhere in the middle and he began at the beginning of a week and so on. He could have been there for at least three weeks or two weeks if the Sabbath kind of bounded that uh, on the outside. He was there for a very, very short time. Didn't have time to ground the Thessalonians in all that much. So they didn't learn everything there was to know. They were fascinating people, but they did some amazing things. I want us to look first of all at verses 9 and 10. We'll put them on the screen for you. How you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 and 10. If you were to, comprom- if you were to kind of try to summarize Christianity, just kind of simplistically describe Christianity, how would you describe it? Well, I think you've got it re- described very, very well and very simply here in this text. Christianity is a serving, actually it's a turning, a serving, and a waiting That's exactly what Christianity is from beginning to end. It's a turning, a serving, and a waiting. He describes for us the uh, serving and so on in the text here. What did I do? Oh, pushed the wrong button. There you go. You turned to serve and to wait. Problem with the Thessalonians, they didn't know what their loved ones who died uh, were going, how they were going to turn out. And so they had a little problem with this waiting part. Paul writes first in 2 Thessalonians to describe for them what happens if the Lord doesn't return in their lifetime. And indeed, he may not return in our lifetime even. But you need to be ready for him to return. But if you're not, uh, if, he, if he doesn't return, what happens to those who've gone on before and have died in Christ? That's the occasion of the letter. That's why he wrote these letters. Look back in chapter 1, verse 3. You're going to find a very familiar triad here in this text. He says, there, we're constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of God, our God and Father. In verse uh, 8, he talks about their example. Verse uh, 6, he talks about them imitating the apostles and their behavior. He talks about their example of faith in that they sounded out the word all throughout Macedonia, Achaia, and elsewhere. These people were on fire for the Lord. They were talking about Jesus Christ and the church, talking the church up, talking Christ up, spreading the gospel of Christ. Their example was wonderful to behold. He speaks of their exemplary behavior. Somebody else mentioned exemplary behavior just a few moments ago. Their exemplary behavior of faith was amazing. So if you look back in the way that we serve the Lord, remember it's a turning, a serving, and a waiting. How do you serve Him? Well, your serving is comprised of three things, really. Your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness or patience of hope. That's what comprises your service to the Lord. The waiting part might be a problem. It was for them. It might be a problem for us too. We might not have the patience to to wait for the Lord's return or to wait until we finally uh, pass on serving the Lord faithfully throughout our lives. But I want you to look at this first part because this is where we uh, talk about modern day idolatry. You turned to God from idols. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is true in everyone's life. You turned to God from idols. When you were serving self before you became a child of God, sin and self sat on the throne of your life, if you picture your heart as a throne room. Jesus Christ was not there. He wasn't Lord of your life. Yourselves were. You made your decisions. You called the shots. You chose what you wanted to do. And just as soon as you became a child of God, you dethroned self, you kicked sin out of your life, Jesus Christ took up occupation on that throne. He became Lord. Lord of lords, King of kings in your life. At least that's the way it's supposed to be. 
For some of us, it's hard for Jesus to stay there. We want to take him back off the throne and put ourselves back up there. And that constitutes the soil of modern-day idolatry. You turned to God from idols. And that's true of every single person in this building and every single person anywhere in the world. That is what ta- that's what's describing for you the conversion experience, how you turned to God. Let's go a little further and see if we can make sense out of this. The problem of modern idolatry is seen in a passage where Paul describes for us what's taking place in the latter days. It's 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's kind of a nauseating picture, but this is a perfect commentary on life today, how we live today, how we act today, how we react today. And in this text, you'll notice what he says. Realize this, that in the last days, we're living in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, some of the kids wonder how that got snuck in there. Ungrateful, unholy, unloving. He goes on to say irreconcilable, malicious gossip, without self-control, brutal, haters of God, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's description of the way people live today. That's the way people live today. Some Christians live this way. Shouldn't, but that's the way some Christians live. Now, I want to again highlight a couple of expressions in this text. Look at what we have highlighted here. First of all, he speaks of those who are lovers of self. He speaks of those who are lovers of money. Then he goes on to speak of those who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of what? Lovers of God. So that constitutes the soil of what we're talking about when we're talking about modern-day idolatry. Because here's what we mean by that. How do you spot modern-day idolatry? You ask yourself this question, what does a person love? What is it that takes up your time? What is it to which you give all of your energy? What is it that you spend all your money on? What is it that you have as goals and dreams for your life? What is it that you plan your life around? What is it? What do you love? That's going to tell a story as to whether or not you're an idolater or not. If you love God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. I think I've heard that somewhere before. And the second is like unto it, the second commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself. Then Jesus says in Mark, there is no greater commandment, bad English, commandment, singular, than these, plural. In Matthew he says, on these two commandments hang or depend all the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter twenty. Two, verses 37 and following. The first of these commandments was given first in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. The second was given in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Somehow, Jesus says the entirety of Scripture, the entirety of the Bible, revolves around these two greatest commandments. Supreme love for God and respectful, and, uh, respectful love for man as self, neighbor as self. That means that we're going to do everything we do in life to honor God and to respectfully love and treat our fellow man as we wish to be treated ourselves. We're going to use our money and use our talents and use everything else uh, to, to honor God. So we're not going to use men, we're not going to use women for our own self-centered purposes. We're going to love them. We're going to use things, not love things, but use things for man's benefit and God's glory. And if you want to know how those things are really worked out throughout the Scripture, that's the basics. We love people and use things for God's glory and man's benefit. We don't use people and love things. That's always backwards. And that's always mistaken thinking. Let's go a little further. What does a person love? Well, he's mentioned a couple of things in this context. He mentioned, first of all, that some might be lovers of self. Notice, well, I had this one. I'm going to back that up for just a moment. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, we were treated to a very despicable, deceitful, um, dishonest, um, I could use a lot of other Ds to describe it, uh, philosophy called self-image, self-worth psychology. It was founded by and promoted by humanistic psychologists who were militant atheists. Rollo May, Carl 
Rogers, Eric Fromm, and Abraham Maslow were militant humanistic atheists. They hated Christianity. They wanted to pose for themselves and promote an alternative religion, a religion of the self, where you could put self first. And they, they marketed it as self-image, self-esteem psychology, and multiplied millions of people bought into it, including many people from pulpits all over the land, screaming out, you've got to love yourself first before you can love others and love God. It's exactly backwards. There are three commandments, some said. Love God, love neighbor, love self. No, Jesus said there are only two. And he's got it backwards because you're to love God first. You may not always love yourself. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah didn't love himself all that much because he was a sinful man until God cleansed him from his sins. God loved him. And he learned to love God. See, the problem with this is that sometimes people oppose an alternative and we buy into it. Sometimes people are lovers of selves. Here's what Scripture actually says. It says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Philippians 2 and verse 3. See, Scripture says, Love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, it says you already love yourself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes, as Paul says in Ephesians 5 verse 29. You don't unlove yourself. You love you. The only question that Scripture would entertain is, do you love somebody else like you love yourself? If you won't give them your time, you won't give them your energy, you don't have any compassion, you don't have any mercy, you don't love them like you love yourself. You're saying, I love me and I don't care about you. If you put wings on that, it's the golden rule. As you would that others do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. What that means is if you want others to treat you mercifully, you treat them mercifully. You want to be others to be good to you, you treat them well. If you want others to be kind to you, be kind to them. If you want others not to murder you, don't you know, murder somebody in your family, don't murder anybody in theirs. And that's kind of the way you live. They may not treat you that way. That's irrelevant. It's the way you want to be treated that dictates how you treat them. And the question is, do you love somebody else enough to invest time, energy, money in them? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Or are you a lover of self instead? Is your time your time? Is your money your money? And so on. Or are you willing to share with others, love others like you love yourself? Paul also says, or Jesus also said, uh, you love your neighbors yourself. That was a passage we quoted a few moments ago. People can sometimes be lovers of self. Uh, Paul also mentioned another thing in this context. I don't know why it's not clicking onward. Well, I'm pointing it. Lovers of money, okay? Put to death covetousness, he says, which is idolatry in Colossians 3 and verse 5, being lovers of money. It's an old story in the McGuffey's Readers. Uh, the kids don't read McGuffey's Readers anymore. Some of you older folks had access to those things. There was an old miser who was a very scrawny fellow who had a, a multiplied fortune, a fortune of coins in this treasure house. And he would go in there and he'd rub his little greedy and skinny fingers through those coins on a regular basis because he was so proud of what he had. Well, on one occasion he was in this little room uh, running his bony fingers through these coins and the wind blew the door shut. Big problem. The door had a latch only on the outside. And so the man could not escape from the self-imposed prison. Years later, someone broke into this treasure trove and found his skeleton draped over those coins. This man had made Mammon his god, and Mammon had killed him. Being lovers of money. Covetousness, he says, is idolatry. Now, covetousness is not something you carve in stone. It's not something you carve in wood or in metal. It's something you make up in the mind. You covet somebody else's things, and that constitutes, he says, idolatry. Again, uh, covetousness is idolatry and so on. Uh, that simply means lovers of money. Going on a little further, you can be lovers of pleasure. Lovers of pleasure. All sorts of different kinds of pleasure. Here's a tennis ball. Uh, that means sports. Sports are the loves of a lot of people. Uh, Lee Trevino is a well-known golfer, professional golfer. He said one time, Golf is my religion. It means more to me than anything else in the world. My wife, my family... Anything. Golf is my religion. 
Well, he put his golfing game first. Maybe that's what it takes to be successful in golf. That's not what it takes to be successful in life. So golf and tennis and so on, these things aren't bad in and of themselves. A lot of other things aren't bad in and of themselves. Television's not necessarily bad. Uh, computers aren't necessarily bad. Uh, sometimes we can tail off into something that might turn to be uh, a little bit bad. You see, sometimes with Christians, your decisions in life are not necessarily between good and evil. They may be. But sometimes your decisions in life are between good, better, and best, or bad, worse, and worst. Let me give you an example. Is it okay to play sports? Well, sure. It's good for us. Is it okay to play sports uh, when worship services are taking place? You see, that's, it might be good in and of itself to play sports, but it's not the best use of your time, the time that God has given to you as a steward, to play sports when worship is taking place and your brothers and sisters are gathered together to honor God. See, there's a difference here. So sometimes good, better, and best are your choices, not necessarily good and evil being your choices. But when people serve pleasure and make pleasure their God, recreation, family time, all these kinds of things, good and of themselves. But sometimes they can be placed before God and they become a problem when that occurs. Lovers of pleasure. One other one here I wanted to show us today, and that is, oh me, there it is, lovers of family. Jesus simply said something that ought to strike home with us. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, verses 36 and 37. Can families get in the way of your service to the Lord? Oh, yes. I can, get, I can tell you the story. I don't really have time today to go into it very much in depth. But a young lady was going to obey the gospel. She came from a very strict Roman Catholic family. Her parents told her, if you do that, we will disown you. She did, and they did. They did not even show up to her wedding. They didn't show up to her baptism. They had nothing to do with her from that day forward at all, period. Can family stand in your way of service to God? Yeah. Can sometimes you find situations in life where parents will forbid their children to go over and worship with those Campbellites? Can you find sometimes where parents come into town or family comes into town and, and, and the family uh, says, well, I, you know, my family only comes in once in a while, and they're here now. I need to stay home with them, so they stay home from services. Instead of saying, well, come on with us, and let's go down and worship God together, they let the family coming in from out of town dictate to them how they should operate. Does family stand in the way sometimes? Can a husband stand in the way of his wife serving God? Can a wife stand in the way of her husband serving God? Can that happen? Do people sometimes put family before they put their Lord? How come it is when a child gets sick, when, a parent, uh, when parents have four children in the family, one child gets sick, everybody has to stay home? I've never figured that out. Had an elder of the church. Sorry to have to tell you this story. He was one of my elders. An elder of the church who lost his father-in-law. The first one, his mother-in-law was married to a preacher. Uh, he died. The second marriage was to a man who was a good man, but he developed macular degeneration, got blind, and he had a number of other health problems, finally died. And she said, well, how could God, a God who loves people, be so cruel to take uh, both husbands away from me? And that was her, kind of, she kind of lost it for a little while. And uh, this elder, her son-in-law, and his wife, her daughter, stayed home with her because they said, well, my mama needs all this help. For a year and a half! And finally... I pushed the point a little bit by writing him a letter and saying, we need your encouragement. We need your example. We've got people here are coming here who have serious cancer problems. One lady who had a, a bladder bag and a, col a colostomy bag, and she'd had severe cancer, never, ever complained, never heard her complain once, always smiled, had an ugly wig on her head, but she came and she taught our children. We had a very, very small number of children. She taught our children. I wrote this man a letter and said, you need to be an example to Barbara. Because Scripture says that people are to imitate your faith. Hebrews 13, verse 8. And right now, you're not providing any example for any of us, brother. And I expected him to come back and make things right. He came back and he said, thank you for writing that letter. It made my decision easier to make. He resigned that day. We've never seen him since. Can family stand in your way of service to God? He who loves father or mother more than me 
is not worthy of me. He loves son or daughter more than me. He's not worthy of me. Listen, you can reach out and wrap your arms around these wonderful, loving little children. You can hold them in your arms. You can't hold God that way because He's not physical. But you can hold them physically. And it's awful easy to fall prey to that temptation to put family first before you put God. Don't let yourself be sucked into that. That's a form of idolatry. Anything put before God becomes God to you. Jesus didn't say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness just to hear Himself talk or to flap His tongue. But He meant it. That's got to be first in your life. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes other things are. They become a problem. The answer to idolatry, how do we answer it? Well, let me, ta- let me ask you to turn to another passage. I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. We're going to read that in just a second. Here's a young man that says, Lord, I'll give you anything but. And he's got a blank there. And you fill the blank in because this is personal. I want you to think about this for your own life. It's not, you know, I don't know most of you. And I don't know your, your life right now. I don't know what's going on in your lives. So when you fill in this blank, you fill it in personally. Don't fill it in with what I put there. I've got my own problems. Lord, I'll give you anything but. Lord, I'll do anything for you but. Lord, I'll change anything in my life for you but. Let me show you a passage in Philippians chapter 1. You have probably seen this passage on numerous occasions. It's very simple. Philippians 1, verse 21, where Paul says, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I want us to read that again, but I want us to leave a couple of words out. I want us to put a blank where Christ is found in this sentence, and a blank where gain is found in this sentence. Okay? Now let's just leave that out and read it. It makes much sense, doesn't it? For me to live is to die. Big deal, we all know that. For me to live is to die. So, truthfully, in my life and in yours, something goes in those two blanks. Something's going to go in those two blanks. For me to live is blank, and to die is blank. And you're the only one who can answer that. God knows, you know, but you're the only one who can answer that, honestly. Carl Walenda was one of the famous flying Walendas. They were a... Uh, an aerialist act, they walked on tight ropes. They were the ones that uh, started the pyramid where four men would be on the bottom, two on top of them, and somebody on top of them when they had bars stretched across their shoulders. Of course, they had a horrible accident and several of them died, fell to their deaths, and Carl kept on walking the tight rope. Uh, he finally died too in an aerialist accident years later, and I don't have time to tell the story because we're running short in time. But I did want to tell you about him because in his wife's narration of his life, She wrote his biography. She said, Carl said, and this is what he believed, for me to live is being on a tightrope. All the rest is just waiting. He filled those two blanks in, didn't he? He filled the blanks in. Now, you fill those blanks in in your life. The way it should read in your life is, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And if it's anything other than that, we've got a problem. We've got a problem. It's a real struggle. Because all of us live more than just a couple of days. And we can be really excited about Christ when we come up out of the baptistry because our sins are forgiven. We can really be on fire for the Lord for a few weeks. But after a while, the fire dies down. We get a little more lukewarm. And life happens. Life happens. Then we have to make these choices. For me to live is, and to die is. Is there a problem with modern-day idolatry? Is there a problem with seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Well, there can be. You're the only one who can answer that question. I don't know in your life, but there probably is in many of us sitting in this auditorium today. As we go a little further, here's the answer to idolatry. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. 
or the gods of the Americas in which land you presently dwell. And by the way, I think some people put America before they put God. Unfortunately, I don't like it at all, but it happens. We've got people who pray in the congregation that I serve. We pray for the first responders and for the military people and for the police and for the fire chiefs and for the... Oh, by the way, we pray for the church too. On they go. Folks, what's happened to our thinking? God's not an American. America might have been blessed by God and I love this country. I'm patriotic as anybody else. And I'll sing with Lee Greenwood all day long. God bless the USA. I love the song. Marvelous song. Brings tears to my eyes. But it's not to be compared with the Lord God of heaven and earth. And we can't put America before God. I can get more people to stand up and sing God bless the USA with their hands over their heart than I can get to sing How Great Thou Art. Something wrong with that picture. Something wrong with it. Please help me understand that, if that's the way we think. The gods of the Amorites or the Americas in whose land you dwell. But Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And here's an admonition from John the Apostle, and we'll close our lesson for the day. 1 John 5, verse 21, John simply says, little children, because it's a prevailing problem, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from idols. Now, this is an important part of our service this morning because it's when we're going to invite people to make a decision for Christ. Song selected is, I have decided to follow Jesus. And you are the only one who can answer the question as to whether that's really, really, really true in your life. As a Christian, you may have decided to follow Jesus at one time, but you've kind of let things lag and have gone back just a step or two, and something else has become more prominent in your life. So I've decided instead to follow something else instead of Jesus. Maybe not quite as much... I'll give you anything in my life, Lord, but... And if you're not a Christian already, you haven't even begun to walk with the Lord. You need to surrender self, get self off the throne, kick sin out of your life, put Jesus there as Lord of Lords, King of Kings, submit to being baptized into Christ, and raised to walk in newness of life. If you have need of anything wherein we can help you to serve God and put Him first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, we'll be more than happy to help you. And in so doing, we're helping ourselves. If you have need of coming, would you come while we stand, while we sing this morning?